Hello friends, you are watching the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I just like to say that, it's fun to say because it's the greatest program in the world. That's right, because we're studying the Bible, we love truth, and even more so this quarter we're studying the three angels' messages, God's end time message for the entire world that's being sent to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people as we've learned, and you get to participate in it with us. And so thank you for joining us uh, here on the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This week we're taking on lesson number eight, which is entitled The Sabbath and the End. So it's going to be a power-packed hour of study. Let me introduce our Sabbath School panel members. To my direct left is Michelle Quinn. How are you? Oh, I'm blessed. And I'm going to be talking about the Sabbath and the beginning, actually. It's going to be the Sabbath and creation. Nice. All right. And to your left is Miss Jill Morconi. Thank you, Ryan. I have Tuesday, a not-so-subtle deception. Mm. All right. And then... Of course, to your left is Pastor James Rafferty. How are you? Good to be here, Ryan. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Creation, the Sabbath and the End. All right. And of course, at the end of the table for Thursday's lesson, Pastor John Loma King. And mine is the Sabbath and eternal rest. Mm. All right. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes, yes. It's going to be, you know, I was wondering when we were going to get to the Sabbath because if you've noticed, it's taken more than half of this quarter just to cover the first angel's message. Mm. And, and rightfully so, because there's just so much there. And I've said in a previous lesson, and that, uh, and I've and I've stuck by this because if if all of the world would respond positively to the first angel's message, there would be no need for a second or third angel's message. But because most of the world does reject that message, now comes the two warnings, which we'll get to in the future. But we're still hanging on to the last portion. I believe we're going to be studying the last portion uh, this week on the first angel's message. Lesson number eight, the Sabbath and the end. I'm going to read the memory text, then we're going to pray. Memory text in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 is a beautiful reminder of who our Creator is. It says, And to, all, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And on that point, Miss Jill, would you have a prayer for us? Sure. Holy Father, we're delighted to open up your word and to see the truth you have for us. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would open our hearts and minds, reveal to us what you want us to hear and learn today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our brother, uh, Mark Finley has done a phenomenal job in putting this lesson together. I've really been blessed and uh, he's left no stone unturned. Everything has just been very clear. And uh, he writes and puts together on Sabbath afternoon's lesson, he says, the essence of humanity's dignity is a common creation. The fact that we are uniquely created by God places value on every human being. The unborn in the mother's womb, the quadriplegic teenager, the Down syndrome young adult, and the Alzheimer afflicted grandmother all have immense value to God. God is their father. They are his sons and daughters. And then it quotes Acts chapter 17 verses 24 through 26 which says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Ours is a shared heritage. We belong to the family of God. We are brothers and sisters fashioned, shaped, and molded by the same God. Creation provides a true sense of self-worth. When the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of your personality, God threw away the pattern. There is no one else like you in all the universe. You are unique. A one-of-a-kind creation. I love that. Mm -hmm. You are a unique, one-of-a-kind creation. A being of such immense value that the God who created the cosmos took upon himself our fleshly bodies and offered himself as a sacrifice for you and your sins. I love that as a great introduction to this lesson this week. And of course, Sunday's lesson is entitled The Judgment, Creation, and and accountability. We've had a few of those. It's been three words that all are linked together in some way, form, or fashion. The judgment, creation, and accountability. And the question that is brought out in the lesson is uh, in pertaining to a few, few passages that we're going to read at this time. But it says, what does judgment imply about issues such as accountability and responsibility? And how are the judgment and the commandments of God and worship linked together? Well, we find the answer as we first dive into the first angel's message that we've been 
been studying so clearly. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Let's revisit that text again. Of course, saying with a loud voice, the Greek word there, megalephone, which means it's a megaphone, it's amplified. God wants the whole world to hear this message. And of course, that message is to fear God and give glory to Him for the hour, notice, of His judgment has come. We are living in this judgment hour. There's an accountability factor. And of course, we're seeing here that it is also tied to the worshiping, the reverence, the recognition that we serve the Creator God, which it says, and worship Him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Now, take that and also read Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. And what does it say? But why do you judge your brother? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We are not our brother's judge. God is the main judge. But how does the commandments of God fit into that factor? Now let's look at James chapter 2 verses 8 through 13 and we'll get a clearer understanding of how these three are formed together or linked together. James chapter 2 beginning with verse 8 and we're going to read through to verse 13. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. It says in verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be, notice, judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And of course, the lesson brings out that, of course, these messages of the three angels flying in midair of Revelation chapter 14 announces that the hour of His judgment, of course, has come. We saw that. Since we are created by God with the capacity to make moral choices, and here's the link here, we are responsible for the decisions that we make. If we are merely a random collection of cells, products of our heredity, our heredity and environment only, our actions would largely be determined by forces over which we have no control. In other words, we are free moral agents. We have choices to make. God has not created us as robots to respond a certain way or forced His will on us to do a certain thing. We are free to make those choices. And there are some scriptures that clearly bring this out. I'm not going to read them all, but I just want to highlight a few here. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, when I read this, well, this is a perfect uh, example that we are free, that God has given us the freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. For it says there, and I'm reading from the New New King James Version first. It says Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. It says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Yes. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now, uh, the NIV, I, I had to pull this one out because, again, that word liberty, many people don't use that word to express uh, freedom. But it goes on to say in Galatians 5 13, again, NIV says, You, brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Okay? Mm -hmm. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. So we are free. We have the choice to make to either serve God or to not serve God. And in every single one of our choices, we are either choosing the side of God or we're not choosing the side of God. John chapter 7, verse 17, it's Jesus is speaking. He says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. In other words, if you choose to do God's will, you have that choice to choose to do God's will or not. There's nothing that's keeping you from doing that. And of course, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 really mm -hmm. nails it down, which clearly tells us to choose, you, choose, for, your day, choose for yourselves this day whom you you will serve. It's a choice. And you know, it's interesting that at the end of the day, when you are choosing, you have the responsibility. In other words, that's, that's what the lesson, Lesson Sunday is entitled uh, here, the judgment, creation, and accountability. You are held accountable for the choice that you make. And Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, I had to bring this out because it gives us some insight behind the very first person who ever sinned. And oftentimes we would, you know, we would think, well, Lucifer sinned. He just made the choice to sin. Absolutely. But it's interesting in how it's worded in this book because it says here in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, so long as all created beings acknowledge the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. 
it was the, it was the joy of the heavenly host to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting His glory and showing forth His praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. But a change came over this happy state. And notice how it's described as this change happens. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to His creatures. Interesting. She said she could have said there was one who sinned. There was one who brought about sin. There was one. How did that happen though? There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Of course, we know this to be Lucifer. Lucifer in making that choice. God creates us with free will. And Lucifer had that choice and he perverted the freedom that God had given him. And of course, we know that the lesson brings out here, it says, but judgment implies moral responsibility. We know that we have a moral responsibility. We only highlight that and I only emphasize that because we live in a day and age where it seems like more and more Christians have this idea that, well, when you just come to Jesus, you mentally accept that Christ is, uh, is Savior. You just simply say though, that, that you know, sinner's prayer, Lord, save me, forgive me. I, I'm sorry, Lord, for what I've done to you. And then Jesus puts his stamp of approval. He pardons you. And then again, you'll hear people say, I got saved. Now I'm saved. But yet they continue to live a life of sin. And the idea behind that is that, well, I can't help the choices that I make because my environment, my, you know, my bad, you know, horrible sinful equipment that I was born with, you know, the things that I got from Adam, all of this bad substance that's, you know, just pulling and tugging at my heart and causing me to sin. I can't help it. So therefore the choice factor is thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. But the Bible makes it very clear that no one, not even Satan himself can force you to sin. He can tempt you. And temptation is not a sin in and of itself because Jesus was tempted. But yet you can be tempted, but you still have the choice to make whether or not you are going to follow God or follow the enemy. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, in this crisis of our earth's history, the judgment hour, God calls us to make decisions in the light of eternity. The first angel's earnest appeal to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters acknowledges that the basis of all worship is the fact that we were created by God. I love that. Meanwhile, our adherence to the seventh day Sabbath, and this is where it comes in. What's the title of this lesson? The Sabbath in the end. We're going to get a lot into the Sabbath this week. It says, meanwhile, our adherence to the seventh day Sabbath demonstrates our belief that Jesus is worthy to be worshiped as our creator. Mm -hmm. It reveals our acceptance of his 10 commandment law as divinely inspired. And it goes on to say, uh, as divinely inspired principles for living life to the fullest. Because the law is the foundation of God's government and a revelation of His character, it becomes the standard of judgment. Our faithfulness to the Sabbath commandment is acknowledged by our commitment to live obedient lives. It was a test for Israel during the days when Moses was taking them into the wilderness to the promised land, and it will be a test for us down here at the end of time. Woo! Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. The Sabbath and the end. Actually, mine is more about the Sabbath and the beginning. Uh, Monday, I'm Shelley Quinn. Monday's lesson is the Sabbath and creation. Let's read Revelation 14, 6 through 7 again, because I want to compare it to the Sabbath commandment. In Revelation 14, 6, John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That's the everlasting covenant, the good news of the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. But the angel is proclaiming with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. Worship is a central issue in the end. Worship him, listen, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now let's compare that to the Sabbath commandment because that language is directly lifted from the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment of Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger 
who is within your gates. For in six days, now here it comes, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Are you hearing that mm -hmm. echoed in Revelation? The sea and all that is in them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He made it holy. Only God can make something holy. That's right. What you see in the Sabbath commandment is the seal of God. When the president of the United States uses a seal, you see his name, you see his title and his territory. Anytime you see a seal right here, we see this is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, who is the creator. So here's God's name, here's his title, creator. And then it explains everything that he made, the heavens and the earth. This is his territory. So it's confirming the territory over which he rules as sovereign of everything that he created. Genesis is the book of beginnings. And it's so interesting to me. God had Moses, he inspired Moses to write two accounts of creation. Genesis 1 is the first account. And we see that what uh, God had Moses focus on, he didn't explain his existence. It was just in the beginning, God. And what Moses focused on in the first account is different than the second account. They are two distinct revelations of God's omnipresence, his ability to be everywhere at one time. In the first account, it is focused on the transcendence of God, that he is above everything that he created. His existence is outside time and space, and it's showing the transcendence of God. It ends with the first chapter, God surveying everything that he made in the first six days, and it is good. Now, the second account, God has Moses reiterate creation, and this time, he is looking at the imminence. That's the up close and personal presence of God. And so what you see is now he's talking about how he created man, forming him with his own hand, getting so up close and personal that he breathed the spark of life, the breath of life into his nostrils. So it shows God's presence inside his created time and space. He is nearby. He is fully present to all of his creation and he's involved with all of his creation. Amen. In the second account, it's God's personal touch on creation. It, it fascinates me. Genesis 2, Genesis 1, everything God created in six days. Genesis 2 is the seventh day. Why did, why did the translators, there wasn't chapters and verses to begin with. Why did they stick that in Genesis 2 account? Because Genesis 2, let's read it, 1 through 3. What happened on the seventh day is God is establishing the weekly cycle. The only reason we have a weekly cycle is because God established it. But he creates a 24-hour period of time for humanity's physical and spiritual refreshment. And it says, Genesis 2, 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. Day. We've had the seventh day repeated twice. That's Saturday. And God blessed the seventh day mm -hmm. three times. He's right. There's no question which day this is. And he sanctified it. That means he set it apart for holy purposes because in it he rested from all of his work which God had created. In the Garden of Eden, God created two institutions of intimacy, marriage and the Sabbath. And you know what? I think the reason translators put this at the first 
uh, the seventh day at the first of the second account of God's up close and personal presence is because this was God's crowning act of intimacy for humanity. God set aside a 24 hour period of time that he didn't want them worried about the work in the garden. He wanted his precious created beings who are created in his image to be able to come and focus that time on him. It's a temple in time, a time that they could enjoy family relations and all of the things that we all, that we worry about are set aside. Mm -hmm. So he wanted special uninterrupted time. What a gift the Sabbath is. Mm -hmm. So we see that the Sabbath, what we just read in Exodus, it's a memorial of God as our creator. But did you know it's also the Sabbath is a memorial of God, that he's the one who sanctifies us? I remember when I first got to Exodus 31, 12 and 13, the Lord says, speak to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbath you shall keep for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. When God called me to full-time ministry, he told me, forget what you think, you know, come sit at my feet and I will teach you. And you know what? He started me on a study of the sanctuary and I realized the 10 commandments were still in place. When I discovered the Sabbath, I was a Sabbath keeper for two years before I even started watching 3ABN or, or know anything about Adventists really. But it was like when the Sabbath would roll in all my life, I had worked so hard to be a good girl, to please God. And I never felt like I could please him. But when I realized it was God who was going to sanctify me, mm -hmm. I entered into his rest and I would just breathe in the Sabbath. I didn't have to worry about anything. And I entered into his rest, praising him for righteousness by faith, praising him that he was the God who not just paid my penalty for sin, but that he was the God who was going to deliver me from the power of sin, sanctify me from sin. And then when you get into Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law for Israel, the constitutional law that is the old covenant, the civil, social, and, and ceremonial but, uh, requirements. In Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 15, as Moses is giving the law a second time, he says, Deuteronomy 15, let me give you verse 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. He's saying, God is your redeemer. Amen. Remember that. So the Sabbath is the eternal rest in him. It is not a legalistic requirement. It reveals true righteousness that is found in him. The Sabbath speaks of things that God has achieved for us that we could never achieve for ourselves. It's a special sign of loyalty to him. It's rest not works. It's grace, not legalism. It's assurance, not condemnation. It's depending totally on him. And that's his plan. Amen. 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 Thank you, Shelly, so much. Well, my friends, we're just getting started. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it to Ms. Jill Morricone for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Pastor Ryan and Shelley. I love your energy and enthusiasm and the subject matter that we're studying, the Sabbath and the end. Thank you so much. I'm Jill Morricone, as Ryan just mentioned. On Tuesday, we discuss a not-so-subtle deception. And we're actually, the entire lesson is focused on the six days of creation and that they're literal, 24 hour period, not eons of time. Now, as we get into it, we might seem like we're taking a roundabout trip to get there, but hopefully by the end, you're gonna see where we're going. Many Seventh-day Adventists and many Protestants and other Christian denominations believe in creation. They don't believe in evolution. They don't believe that, say, four, four and a half billion years ago, the first molecules occurred as evolutionists believe. They don't believe that later cells began living together more efficiently or to gain protection from something bigger and these cells eventually morphed into sponges. As evolution teaches, that was 800 million years ago. Evolution teaches 370 million years ago, certain fish shimmied landwards as primitive lizard-like animals known as tetrapods. And then 220 million years ago, now we don't believe this, I'm being clear, this is evolutionary theory, the first dinosaurs and mammals occurred. Or maybe 200,000 years ago, homo sapiens, humans as we know and understand them today, emerged. Instead, we hold to the biblical account of creation. Let's look at that, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created, that word we talked about before, bara. It means God made something from nothing and it's always used when God is the subject. He created the heavens and the earth, verse two. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, if you have read Genesis chapter one, you know the creation account, what happens on day one is light. Mm -hmm. Day two is air. Day three is the dry land and the vegetation. Day four, God begins to fill what he created before. In other words, day four is the sun, moon, and stars. That fills day one, which was the light. Day five is the fish and birds. That fills day two, which was the air in the seas. Day six is the animals and man. That fills what God made on day three, which is the dry land and the vegetation. Of course, day seven, which Shelley talked about so beautiful, God set aside a 24 hour period that was sanctified, made holy, set apart for you and I to worship God. This is where things become interesting, not only in the Christian world, but within the Seventh-day Adventist church. We believe in creation, but there are many people who believe in what is called old earth creationism. This is an umbrella of theological views. Day age creationism, gap creationism, progressive creationism, even theistic evolution all fall under this umbrella of old earth creationism. An old earth creationist is someone who does not see an inherent conflict between scripture and evolution. Namely, they do not believe in the literal six-day creation week. In fact, many age, old earth creationists believe that this earth that we live on is maybe four billion years old. Mm. That each day of creation took a long time, eons of time. We lose the power of God to speak and it be done. We lose the biblical interpretation of the 24 hour period. We lose the seventh day cycle at the end of the weekly period. Why do I bring this up? 
of course, is in the lesson. But in addition, the last general conference session, I had the privilege and opportunity of serving as a delegate there in the decisions made by the Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. Church. And I was on the floor and present when people, now these are not people in the fringes of the church, these are people who were elected as representatives for their church, said there is no literal six-day creation mm -hmm. week. When God created the world, it was not in six days. Mm -hmm. These are solid people within our own church. Mm -hmm. It is so vitally important that we understand the reasons why we believe in a literal six-day creation week. So I want to give you seven reasons that I believe in the literal six-day creation week. Reason number one is the usage of the word day. If you look in the Hebrew at the word for day, which is yom, it's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament, and it's translated day, and other times it means a longer period of time. So you say, aha, I got you. So when it says, if you read Genesis 1, verse 5, it says, so the evening and the morning were the first day. And they said, well, if day can mean literal 24 hour or day can also mean an age or an eon of time, how am I supposed to know? Well, in the Bible, every time the word day, yom, is used with a numeral as the adjective, it always refers to a literal 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. When it says the first day, there's your adjective, the numeral. It means first day, literal 24-hour period, or second day, or a third period, third day. It always refers to, and Pastor Mark Finley brought that out beautifully in the lesson, mm -hmm. to a 24-hour period. Reason number two to believe in the literal six-day creation week is the usage of time. What do I mean by that? The same passage in Genesis 1-5 says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening comes from the word sunset. Now, can you imagine a sunset lasting eons of time? Of course not. It's a literal sunset. And the morning, a literal sunrise, were the first day. Reason number three is the usage of logic. What I mean by that is, what if vegetation created on the third day and we had 100,000 years until the sun, moon, and stars were created? How in the world is photosynthesis supposed to happen? How in the world is life supposed to happen? How is warmth supposed to happen? We learned on an earlier lesson about the importance of the sun and what that does. So it's just the use of logic. Reason number four is the use of God's words. You look at the Word of God. Psalm 33, 6, how did creation happen? By the Word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast creation happened with just a word of God no amoebas changing life forms no eons of time God spoke and it was done now that's Old Testament but in the New Testament in Hebrews 11 verse 3 it says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. Reason number five is the usage of the seventh day Sabbath. Shelley read Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, there we have the word yom for day, but it's seventh day, literal 24 hour period. God ended his work he had done and he rested on the seventh day. We have the literal six day week. And at the final end of that, we have the seventh day Sabbath. You see, we lose the sanctity of the seventh day Sabbath if we lose the literal six day creation week. Reason number seven, we're going to skip six for now. You can ask me about it later. Reason number seven is the usage of the spirit of prophecy. There's a great quote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 111. Sister White quotes from the, the fourth commandment, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is, is in them, and rested the seventh day. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This reason appears beautiful and forcible when we understand the days of creation to be literal. 
The first six days of each week are given to man for labor because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor in commemoration of the Creator's rest. But the assumption that the events of the first week required thousands upon thousands of years strikes directly at the foundation of the fourth commandment. It represents the Creator as commanding men to observe the week of literal days in commemoration of vast, indefinite periods. This is unlike his method of dealing with his creatures. It makes indefinite and obscure that which he made very plain. It is infidelity in its most insidious form. Its real character is so disguised that it is held and taught by many who profess to believe the Bible. It is a serious deception when we believe that creation took eons of time. We need to stand on the word of God that he created this world in six literal days. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Shelley. And thank you, Ryan. I've learned that I can choose to enter into the justifying, sanctifying rest of God at the end of seven literal days. <laughs> <laughs> My name is James Rafferty, and we are looking at Wednesday's lesson, which is very close to the title for this week. It's, it adds to the word creation, creation, the Sabbath, and the end. And I am so thankful that I was given this particular day because this is just a beautiful, powerful message that God has given us in the Three Angels' Messages. It focuses on the very last warning that God gives us as the Lesson Quarterly brings out Revelation chapter 14, verses 7, 9, and 12. Those are the three verses that we're going to focus in on, Revelation 14, 7, 9, and 12. Read those verses and summarize each verse in the sentences below is what the quarterly asks us to do. Revelation 14.7, summary, it's a call to worship God. Revelation 14.9, summary, is a solemn appeal not to worship the earthly rulers instead of God. Mm -hmm. And Revelation 14.12 describes a people who have patience, who keep God's commandments, and have the faith of Jesus. You know, many times we're asked as Seventh-day Adventists, why we harp so much on the Seventh-day Sabbath? <laughs> we're always talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath. You guys are always talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath. I don't know if you, anyone's ever said that to you, but it seems like uh, from time to time someone will just complain about that. And my, my immediate response to that is, well, really, it's not really us. It's, it's actually, it's God that does that. You know, God's the one that actually puts a lot of emphasis, especially when you get to Revelation chapter 14, because the book of Revelation is summarizing, if you will, the entire Bible. That's right. The everlasting gospel is not some new idea. You know, it's synonymous with the everlasting covenant, with everlasting salvation. It's found through the entire Bible, and God is yes. kind of bringing it all together in Revelation. And there in this last message, when, I, when we say last message, we mean when this message is given, Babylon falls and Jesus returns, Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. So we have in Revelation chapter 14, God's last appeal to the world. And he highlights, he emphasizes, he focuses on the final issue, and that issue is worship. And worship to God, again, quoting from Shelley, going all the way back to Exodus 20, is directly connected to the fourth commandment. It's a direct quotation from the fourth commandment that we read in Revelation 14 and verse 7, to worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. So there's a connection there that we can't avoid talking about. In fact, the word remember means, among other things, to mention. The word remember, the Sabbath day, that word remember means to mention. So God is actually asking us to mention this to you. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. We're mentioning it to you. But one of the things that I find so vital about the Sabbath and a misunderstanding of the Sabbath, I hope we can clear up right here, and that is the idea that keeping the Sabbath is legalism that it's a legalistic thing for the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we're in the New Covenant now, we're under grace. And I really think that's a misunderstanding. And I think Satan has a lot to do with that, you know, confusing us. Babylon just confuses us about the gospel. The, the, the call to worship God comes under the title of the everlasting gospel. Amen. So it can't be legalism. There's gotta be something more to it than that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love this phrase, creation, the Sabbath, and the end because it connects Genesis with Revelation mm -hmm. and puts it all together in the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to understand that, we just have to go back to creation. We have to recognize that when God created the world, we weren't there. 
<laughs> not the first day, not the second day, not the third day, not the fourth day. Not, we weren't cr created until after God created the animals on the sixth day. We were the last ones to be created, human beings. And the first thing that God asked us to do after we were created was rest. <laughs> but were we tired? <laughs> I don't think so. There was something significant here, or there is something significant here that I just absolutely love. And that is the fact that God created everything for us. He gave us dominion over the, the earth and everything that was in it. He created everything for us without us. There was nothing that we could point to and say, hey, you see that tree over there? God did the trunk, I did the branches. He did the leaves, I did the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> None of it was done by, we didn't participate in creation. The only thing God asked us to do after he created was to rest, mm -hmm. Sabbath rest, to rest in everything he created for us without us. That's right. Now, That's when you look at the plan of salvation, and I want us to look at a Bible verse here that's really significant. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. When you look at the plan of salvation, you're going to find that the plan of salvation is a plan of recreation. Recreation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, King James says, or a new creation. All things are passed away and behold, all things will become new. There's a time coming when this earth, this old earth is going to pass away and all things will be going to become new in the earth. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Before God does that, he makes a new creation within us. We become a new creation. Now this is really significant because as we go back to creation week and we recognize that God is the only creator and that he creates by the power of his word and that we are to rest in everything that he did for us without us, that's how we were created, that's when we were perfect, we see a parallel to his new creation. And here's the parallel. Jesus Christ came to this earth as the second Adam. That's what we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first Adam was of the earth, the second Adam was the Lord of heaven. He came as the second Adam. And as the second head of the human race, the second Adam, Jesus Christ accomplished everything that was necessary for our recreation. Just like he did in creation week, he repeated that in recreating the human race in himself. He was obedient. He was without blemish and without spot. He lived a perfect sinless life. That's what we needed. He also died our death. He took our penalty. He stepped into our place. He took our punishment as our substitute. That's what we needed. He also defeated death. He resurrected on the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That's right. Everything God accomplished in Jesus Christ was the work of recreation. In fact, in the work of creation, God came to the sixth day, he created humankind and he said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. In the work of recreation, Jesus Christ hung on the cross on the sixth day. And just before he committed his, his, his uh, life into the Father's hands, he said, it is finished. What was finished? The work of recreation was finished. Mm -hmm. That's why we as Seventh-day Adventists keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Because the seventh day Sabbath reminds us of everything Jesus Christ has done for us without us. And it calls us to rest in his completed work Amen. in such a way that that rest brings us to keeping the Sabbath mm -hmm. and all of the commandments because really Sabbath keeping is the core power of obedience to all the other commandments. Mm -hmm. Why so? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but just a little nugget here. When we enter into rest with, we were just talking about this on the set, when we enter into rest with God on a weekly basis, on a regular basis, day after, week after week, month after month, year after year, sometimes we kind of forget it is the Sabbath. And we start living the sanctified life every day of the week. It's like it just draws you close to God. Mm -hmm. So we, we, re we remember the Sabbath because we remember that He, Jesus Christ, trod the wine press alone of the people that were none with Him. And when He went down on Friday, down into that darkness, he rested on the seventh day. That's His right. disciples rested on the seventh day. And then of course he resurrected on that third day, on that Sunday morning, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. So 
God is calling us in relationship to the Sabbath. He's calling us to enter into the finished work of creation that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And we do that by keeping, by remembering the Sabbath day, by mentioning the Sabbath day, by marking the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In fact, the word remember also means mark. And we're going to find as we look at the big picture in Revelation chapters 13 and 14, that there are those who mark the number of earthly powers, the beasts, they're identified as symbolically and those who remember or mark the day that God has set aside to worship Him. And the contrast is going to be made clearer and more distinct as we get closer and closer to the end of time. But the contrast is going to be made manifest not simply in going to church on a certain day. It's going to be made manifest in the character of those who keep God's commandments versus the character of those who follow the powers of this earth. The character of those who keep God's commandments is going to be sanctified and holy. They're going to be Christ-like because they're going to be following the Lamb whithersoever He goes. Amen. Wow, thank you, James. Thank you, everyone, for laying all that. It's so beautiful when we look at the Sabbath from so many different dimensions. The Sabbath is dimensional, multi-dimensional. Well, mine is the Sabbath and eternal rest, but I want to begin, you know, you've covered so much, you know, the deficit of being down here is so much of what I want to say has already been said. Mm -hmm. However, I planned for that. I want to come at the Sabbath from a different perspective. And I made this statement recently in the sermon I did called the Sabbath, Jesus, the Sabbath and the Jews. And I would encourage you to look at that. Uh, Jesus, the Sabbath and the Jews addressing issues that are often cited as the reason why we shouldn't keep the Sabbath. It's amazing to me that the Jews are often used to delegitimize Christ rather than the other way around. Mm. And what Jesus did is often challenged by the Jews and even still today, many clergy use the Jews to try to make it appear as though Jesus even violated the Sabbath. Mm. How sad that is because if he did, we are all, all lost. Right. We cannot be saved by a redeemer who fell into transgression. Mm. So let me bring out a few things, you know, and I made this statement. I want to say it here again today as we talk about the Sabbath. Uh, deception never solidifies overnight. It takes time for uh, lies to turn to concrete. Mm. And Satan has taken 6,000 years to put together a multiple list of lies that are now concrete today. So that while we're talking about the Sabbath, some of you at the mention of the word, there's something that happens in you. There's like a clock that just skips a beat. There's like a, a feeling that comes over many of you when you hear the Sabbath for a number of reasons. You don't keep it. And secondly, immediately all the things you've been taught in your mind just come to the surface and you find every possible reason why the Sabbath should not be honored. Mm -hmm. When in fact, if you think about creation, there would be no reason for us to have a seven day week today if the Sabbath was not a part of that last day. The Bible makes it very clear. Creation took only six days. Why give us a seven day week? I, I use this experiment on an atheist up in uh, Washington State. I mentioned we had a program on 3ABN where there was an atheist on the set. We didn't know about it until after the program, but he was there helping in a missionary project and I met him again at ASI, sat him down for a couple of days and I talked about this particular thing and I asked him a question. I said, how many days are there in a week? He said, seven days. I said, what evidence do we have that there's a seven day week? Can we find that in the stars? No. Can we find that in the sun going up and the sun coming down? He said, no. Can we find that in the cycles of the moon during the month for 30 days? He says, no. Can we find that in the four seasons of the year? Anything astronomical? He says, no. I said, where's the only place we can find a seven day week? And he thought about it and he thought about it. I said, he says, I don't know. I said, the Bible. Mm. That's right. So if you believe in the seven day week, why don't you believe in God? And that threw him for a loop. Mm. You believe in the seven day week. I do. Mm. The only place it's mentioned is in the Bible. Mm. And after two days discussing at the end of that, it was an ASI. He says, um, you know, for the first time in my adult life, I think there's a possibility that God can exist. Mm. We never met again, but that seed was planted. Mm. You see, the only two institutions that God blessed the creation are the very two institutions, as Shelley pointed out, and I think it was mentioned again, that Satan has sought to cast an aspersion on the Sabbath and marriage. And I want to just point out something very quickly, because in both cases, the Sabbath and marriage are distorted today in this society, but it's not happened recently. It's just become more apparent because we are a people of the modern generation. Let's talk about the Sabbath distortion. 
Instead of keeping God's seventh day holy as he asked it to, countless Christians say, here, watch the excuse, as long as we love the Lord, that's all that matters. <laughs> and they pick the day they prefer. But look at the diabolical nature here. The same thing is said about the distortion of marriage. You see, God, the Bible Sabbath is man to woman. But men marry men and women marry women and they use the same excuse. As long as we love each other, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. And then they pick the gender they prefer. Look at the devil. People that say they love God pick the day they prefer and people that love each other pick the gender they prefer. In both cases, the Sabbath and marriage are distorted. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing, it's classic how Satan leads professed Christians to pick the day they prefer and people of the world to pick the gender they prefer. And in both cases, they say, as long as we love. Well, friends, love is not a license for disobedience. You can't put a love coin in a disobedient machine and say that God accepts what we do. Real love, if you love me, Say it again. If you love me, that's a fact. That's not a suggestion. So true love for God doesn't say, I believe in the God of creation, but I don't believe what God created. How ironic that is that people that worship God. So today the issue is not worship. My brother James, we're sons of thunder. The issue is not worship. The issue is true worship. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14 calls us not back to worship, but to true worship, mm -hmm. that's why it says, worship him who made the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And the Israelites were not the first ones to do that. Exodus, Genesis 26 and verse 5, Abraham mm -hmm. kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. He was not a Jew. It was not until Abraham had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob was then uh, transformed by overcoming and wrestling with Christ that he was named Israel. And then on, the Israelites came forth, went into Egypt as Hebrews came out as Israelites, the called out ones. Mm -hmm. Even before they got to Sinai, Exodus 5 and verse 5, Pharaoh was upset because Moses gave them a day to rest. That word there in, in rest is Shabbat. The Sabbath was restored in Egypt before the Israelites even left. That's why in Genesis, Je Exodus chapter 16, before they got to Sinai and the Lord tested them every day with manna, he says, notice what he said, a time question. How long do you refuse to keep my commandments, my statutes, and my laws? How long? Why ask me how long? when I didn't just, I just got the Sabbath. Mm. Friends will remind you that was two weeks. Be, that was two weeks before they got to Sinai that the Lord asked them, how long do they refuse to keep his commandments? Why would you ask me how long? We haven't even gotten to commandments yet. We haven't even gotten to Sinai for you to write them down. So here's my point. Sinai was not the inception of the Sabbath. That's right. The end of creation, the end of creation week was. Mm -hmm. It's the only day God blessed, sanctified, hollowed and rested on. So to ask us to honor the Sabbath today, the issue is not worship. The issue is true worship. Mm -hmm. John 4 verse 23 and 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper, you see the three angels messages as we point out, one of the reasons why you don't hear that in other churches because they have ignored true worship mm -hmm. and they have settled for worship. That's right. mm -hmm. So worship music without uh, without true worship is not acceptable by God. How do I know that? That's the very question that was asked. Uh, Titus talks about this. Titus 1 verse 6. You know, let me finish John 4 verse 23 and 24. Verse 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper must worship or will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why? Look at this. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's not looking for worshipers. He's looking for true worshipers. Verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him should worship, must, must worship in spirit and in truth. Notice the Bible doesn't separate the two. So to say that the Holy Spirit hasn't impressed me for truth, that's false. I mean, I got to be very candid with you. That's false piety mm -hmm. because the Holy Spirit never convinces you to ignore truth and didn't settle for worship that you prefer. You don't pick a day you prefer. You don't pick a gender you prefer. You don't pick a Sabbath you prefer. Even when people say Saturday is your Sabbath and Sunday is my Sabbath, even that is a satanic lie because there is no day other than the day God blessed. That's the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You can't make a day holy. What God blesses is blessed forever. You can't change. Nothing can be added to it. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be taken from it. Mm -hmm. So the Lord is not looking for people that want to worship him. Even those who scoff, notice what they said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. 
they even notice that God hasn't changed. They says, they said, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Mm -hmm. Notice that statement. Even though they scoff at the coming of the Lord, they said, nothing's changed. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, meaning God didn't change his Sabbath. Kept in, blessed in Genesis, honored throughout the Old Testament by Abraham before the Jews, by the Jews because they were depositors of God's truth, by Jesus, mm -hmm. by the disciples, by the apostles, attacked during the Dark Ages. The Church of Rome substituted that. They even admit it. So Sunday Christian, what foundation on which, what do you stand on? Mm. Be honest and say you followed the dictates of Rome don't say the Bible gives you a license to honor the first day of the week. It's not there. 59 times the Sabbath is mentioned in the New Testament. 12, it's mentioned the first day of the week. And Shelley knows not a single one of them gives us a new day of worship. Eight of them refers to the, to the resurrection. Four of them refer to other instances, the collection on the first day of the week, the Jews, the, the disciples hiding for fear of the Jews, and the breaking of bread on the first day of the week. But they broke bread every day, and there's only one other one that you have, and that one doesn't give you license to honor a new day. So here's my point. If you love the Lord, if you truly love the Lord, you will do what he said. And I like what James says. Why do we keep saying, why do we keep talking about the Sabbath? Because if you love the Lord, here's what I say to you. Remember the Sabbath day mm -hmm. to keep it holy. Amen. Ooh, Amen. man. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. <laughs> some truth has been preached today. <laughs> Anyways, uh, wow, let's get some final thoughts. That's powerful. The Sabbath is the eternal link between the perfection of the past of Eden and the eternal glory of the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah 66 verse 23 says, when God has created the new heavens and the new earth, it shall come to pass from one Sabbath to another, mm -hmm. all flesh shall come to worship before me. We think maybe it doesn't matter. I can believe that creation, I still believe in creation, but it could have taken a long period of time. It does matter. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's biblical. Number two, we lose the seventh day Sabbath and the weekly cycle if we don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Satan is trying to usurp the seventh day Sabbath. He's trying to change it because it is linked together with the everlasting gospel. Yes. God has laid out the plan of salvation in resting in him on the seventh day Sabbath. And Titus 1 verse 16, don't profess to know God and deny him by your works. He said, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him. What works? Ceasing from your works and entering into the Sabbath rest is evidence that you profess and confess and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't follow something man established. Follow what God established. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I remember my own experience years ago when I uh, was not a Sabbath keeper. I had to come to grips with what the Word of God actually taught. And I can tell you, my friends, it's been one of the greatest decisions I've ever made to follow the truth of God's Word, to be a true worshiper. Well, we have made our way through the first angel's message next week, lesson number nine, entitled A City Called Confusion. You're not going to want to miss next week as we're going to be diving into the second angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. Until next week, my friends, God bless you all. See you right back here.